public service announcement. Where are we going over the next couple of months? Uh, first, we're going to be looking at Psalms this Sunday and next, then uh, Proverbs, and then on uh, February 2nd, we're going to begin and take a month to look at what we're going to call toxic charity. There's this, you want to help people because God says love your neighbors. If in helping them you make them dependent and they're not able to stand on their own two feet, have you really helped them? We're going to take the month of February and chew on that. And it's, it's, it'll be good. Then uh, we're going to hit Ash Wednesday and Lent and we're going to look at the rhythms of the Christian life. We talk every Sunday about we should do this or that or the other. And if we spend all of our time doing everything we've ever been told to do in a sermon, there wouldn't be enough hours in the day, would there be? And so we're going to take Lent to look at what does a healthy Christian life look like? What are the rhythms? How do you hold it all together in such a way that uh, you don't feel frazzled? Because I think we do end up being frazzled on a regular basis. And then after Easter, we're going to look at the practices of forgiveness and reconciliation as central to what Jesus does and who we are. So that's kind of where we're going over the next months. But for right now, we're going to look at the Psalms. We're going to look at the Psalms because you really can't get away from them. They are really pretty much everywhere you look in the Christian faith. They are in the prayers that we pray. They are in the hymns that we sing. Even, in the, even when they take the Bible and they ditch the entire Old Testament, you know those little itty-bitty Bibles they hand out? What's the only part of the Old Testament they keep? Psalms and Proverbs. And I, I do not condone ditching the Old Testament. That, that I don't, there's a problem with that. But it is interesting that no matter, you always keep the Psalms. And if you've ever wondered why, it is because they are the best spiritual guide ever written. Just hands down. It, it, it is as good as it gets. It is impossible to find anything better if you want to learn how to pray, to talk to God, and, and to listen to what God has to say. I would go so far to say as if you could only have one book out of the Bible, I'd pick Luke. If you could have two, only have two books out of the Bible, pick a gospel, and I think the Psalms would be a solid second choice. Because one teaches you who it is the God that you worship, and the, second, and the Psalms then teaches you how to speak and talk and, and pray to that God. I was reminded of this a few weeks ago when I was, uh, I was reading an article, a blog post online, and I'll just confess up front, I have forgotten the author of this blog post. I forgot her name, which is bad form, I'm sorry. But uh, I was reading this story she was writing, and she was looking back years and years and years ago when she was first going off to seminary. And she was sitting there, she was going to go to seminary in the next week, and she was sitting there with her mentor, the lady who had first invited her to church, who had been her godmother, who had shown her how to read scripture, who had helped her, I mean, just been there with her to be all the way to get her to the place where she was then, where she is now discerned she is going to go off and go to seminary and become a pastor. And this mentor tells her, you know, as you go to seminary, just remember this. When you're leading a church, the first thing you need to do is teach people how to pray. And the young lady who's sitting there is thinking, well, I mean, there's all this theology and Bible and service, all these other things that are really important. And she was, it's one of those moments where you get a piece of advice and it's from someone you respect and you're not really sure if you agree with it, but you kind of nod because you're being polite. And that's what she did. And so she goes off to seminary and she spends years learning Bible and theology and Greek and Hebrew and all that. And now, decades later, she looks back and she's having one of those, those sort of my dad was right moments where she's looking back and seeing that her mentor was right. That you can, you can know everything there is to know about God, but knowing about God is a very different thing than knowing God. You can know about God all day long and that doesn't matter a lick when actually push comes to shove and the rubber hits the road. If you want to know God, you need to be able to pray. And the best way to learn how to pray is to spend time with the Psalms. It is the single best way to learn how to pray, to, to live with the Psalms. It is in learning to uh, pray, it's in be, being, it's be, learning to pray, we become what that, that first Psalm describes, a, 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 a tree planted in the Garden of Eden, able to produce fruit month after month, no matter what the season. 
And if you think about that, that is just an amazing description of what we would hope our lives would be. Deeply planted, be able to bear fruit day in and, and day out. And to pray the Psalms is how we begin to, to do that. To join with the saints across the century in giving thanks to God and, and praising God. N not because God's not going to give us more until we say thank you for what we've already got. That, that's not how it works. To pray the Psalms, to learn to pray them well, it is to allow them to sh show us the truth every day. It's, it, we praise God because God is good. We, we are thankful to God because God gives us so much each and every day. It, it is, and, and there are other aspects of our lives as well. There are days that we are not thankful for. There are some days I would never re relive again. I, couldn't pay me enough. And, and the Psalms helps us to learn how to pray in those moments as well. We, we go through the Psalms and there's everything in the Psalms from the joy of Psalm 118. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And, and that shows us how to pray in days of joy. And then there are, the, there are when we have moments of rage or despair, there's Psalm 94. When we call down God's vengeance on those who have done us wrong. And uh, we, we learn how to be able to pray even, in, in, even from joy to despair to hope to, to... It's all there in the Psalms. To do this well, I mean, we could talk about this in the abstract all day long, but, but to do this well, you know, you got to see how someone else has done it. We, we learn from other people. You, abstractions are great. What's this actually look like, Andy? How do you take the Psalms and begin to be formed by them and live them and to pray them? And, and to that point, I'm going to tell you three little stories, three little vignettes of how different people at times have used the Psalms in their lives. I want to tell you about Orthodox Jews, Catholic monks, and a Lutheran pastor. We're going to start with Orthodox Jews. Orthodox Jews uh, are people utterly committed to following all 613 of the commandments in the Old Testament. If you ever go through the Old Testament and count up how many times it says thou shalt or thou shalt not, it's 613. And uh, that's how many commandments. And these, these Orthodox Jews are committed to following each and every one. And so along that, that path of, of following each and every one, they have been formed by the Psalms to be thankful at every point in the day. So there's always something that you can pray and give thanks. And, and so they have developed the, these little prayers that they use every at every instance, the first thing an Orthodox Jew prays as he or she wakes up is, I give thanks before you, living and eternal King, who has returned my soul unto me in compassion. Great is your faithfulness. Every day, the first thought you, you have as you wake up is that. That's what you, you pray. And then after you wash your hands, there's a prayer. After you go to the bathroom for the first time, there's a prayer. Let me read you this one. It's a little bit longer than most, but it's just fabulous. Blessed are you, our God, who formed Adam him with wisdom and created within him many openings and many cavities. It is obvious and known before your throne of glory that if one of them to be ruptured or one of them were to be blocked, it would be impossible to survive and to stand before you for even an hour. Blessed are you who heals all flesh and acts wondrously. Isn't that great? <laughs> They go out about your day and there's a prayer for when you put a fence up around a hazard to protect your cattle. There's a prayer for that. There's a prayer for when you hear bad news. Blessed are you, our God, King of the universe, the true judge. There's a prayer for hearing good news. There's a prayer when you have a snack. Blessed are you by whose word everything comes to be. There's a blessing for uh, seeing an exceptionally beautiful person or tree an especially uh, strange looking person or animal. Blessed are you, our God, King of the universe, who makes the creatures different. And out, on seeing an outstanding secular scholar, on seeing a rainbow, upon seeing lightning, upon hearing thunder, if you ever witness 600,000 Jews together, there's a prayer for that. I doubt they pray it often, but they have it just in case. There's a prayer for uh, washing the hands before you eat and during, and there's a there's a special prayer just for when you drink grape, uh, the, the fruit of the grape, grape juice or wine, even if it's in the middle of the meal. And I, I'm not telling you about this 
Well, I'm telling you about this because I think it's fascinating. But I'm not telling this, you about this because I want you to do it. I'm telling you about this to, to show you how one group of people took the, the Psalms and the way that it, it, it can shape how we respond to everything. Anger and, and rage and joy and hope. And, and the Psalms give us the words for how to respond. And, and th this is how this people did it. They, they took the, that influence and they, they took it even farther. And they said, it, there we can pray so often so that it becomes natural. So that in every situation, the response is to turn to God and, and to offer it to God. That, that's worth noting. That's worth, I don't think we should try to do it quite like that, but it is something to, be in, to inspire us. To go from uh, the Orthodox Jews to now move to Catholic monastics of the Middle Ages, 1200, 1300s or so. They also took the Psalms and it, and it formed how they lived. It formed them a bit differently. And what they would do is they would pray every Psalm every day. All 150. You get up in the morning, you start with Psalm 1, and before you go to bed at night, you've gone through Psalm 150. And it's not like they all got in a row and they stood there and they chanted it together. It's just as they lived their day, as they were washing dishes or planting, or as they were just doing whatever they were doing, they were just going through the Psalms. <clears throat> so that it sort of soaked in, it, it sort of became part of them. And it was all of the Psalms. And I think it's important to note this. Not because I want you to start reciting all 150 psalms every day. If you wanted to, go for it. It would take a while to memorize. But because they did all 150 psalms, and what we tend to do is kind of cherry pick Psalm 22, 23, 41, 119, 140. I mean, we kind of cherry pick the popular psalms and ignore the rest. No, if you do that, you just pick the fun ones. And, and there's more to the psalms than that. And to give credit where credit is due, in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church did a great job teaching people to pray, and that's still true today. If there's one church that's doing a great job at teaching people how to pray, it's the Catholic Church. You know, you, uh, they say the rosary, right? When they say the rosary, there are 50 beads around. It's called a decade. Uh, there are five decades. You say 50 Hail Marys as you go around. And the practice, if you say a full Hail, uh, Hail Mary, you go around three times. So how many times do you say Hail Mary? 150, which lines up with the 150 psalms. So that's the practice. The monks would sing, say all 150 psalms in a day, and the layperson would say the 150 Hail Marys, because everyone is going to learn how to pray in the Catholic Church. And at, to this day, they, they do a great job of that. But that's... We're probably not going to start doing that, that here. We're not going to start saying all 150 psalms. We're probably not going to start doing as Orthodox Jews do and start saying, learning specific blessings for each situation. What I think we can do is, is learn from the third story I want to tell you, uh, the story of a modern uh, Lutheran pastor by the name of Rick Lisher. Great guy. He's a Lutheran pastor over in North Carolina, and he teaches uh, preaching at the seminary I went to. And, and I remember one day... We were just shooting the breeze after a class, and uh, people were talking about how, how do you keep on reading as a pastor? Because the temptation is to read for stuff to preach, and how do you keep on reading for yourself? Because you, you got to keep on reading for yourself, or you just, it, it ain't good if you don't. Um, and various people were saying, you know, I read a little bit of this, a little bit of that. Some people were saying, you know, I read the Bible. And, and everyone was kind of sharing notes, and, and what Rick Lisher said was, I read three psalms a day. Every day. He's been doing it for years and years and years. He reads three psalms a day. And he said, you know, I'm not quite sure that's the, the best thing to do, but it's what I do. And, and he told a story about that later, that uh, when 9-11 happened, everyone... He, Everyone had to gather and do something, right? 9-11 happened, huge trauma. You got to respond somehow. And the seminary is trying to figure out how to respond. And, and they, no one, you're going to get together and have a, a, a worship. But what are you going to preach on? What's the text you preach on after 9-11? The guy who, who could say this is the right thing to preach on was Rick Lisher. Because he could go through the Psalms and he just knew the Psalms. And he could say this is the... He said which one it was, and I forget, which is very embarrassing. But he said, now this is the psalm. This is the psalm that gets despair and hope together, and that's what we're feeling, and this is the psalm we need to preach, and this is, the, this is what we do to turn to this day, so we can turn to God even on 9-11. And I thought, that's impressive. 
that, that's impressive. This is someone who knows how to pray. And so I don't think we need to be like Orthodox Jews or middle-aged monastics, but I think we might be able to be a little bit like a Lutheran pastor. Start reading some Psalms. Now it's my confession to you this day that I'm bad at this. Oh my God, I'm bad at reading the Psalms. The Psalms to me are like coffee when I was 12. When I was 12 years, who liked coffee when they were 12 years old? No one likes coffee when you're 12, right? But I didn't like to go to bed, uh, uh, so I had to get up in the morning and go to school, and, and I needed caffeine, because caffeine would make my, my day a lot better. And so I learned to drink coffee because I needed the caffeine, and that's exactly what the Psalms are. I love coffee because I needed the caffeine, and the coffee is how I learned to get the caffeine, and over time I, I learned to love the coffee. I wrote this sermon over a great cup of coffee in Starbucks. The Psalms are the same thing. I need to be better at prayer. I truly do. I need to continue to develop to learn how to pray because I can't teach you how to pray unless I continue to learn how to pray. And, and the best way to learn how to pray, read those Psalms. They're not my favorite book in the Bible. But I learned to love the coffee because I need the caffeine and I can learn to love the Psalms because I need to continue to learn how to pray. I, I wish I didn't have to confess that, but eh, that's, that's, that's it. So next week... I, I'm working on something that is going to help me read the Psalms in a way that's going to work for me, and I'm putting together this little tool, and, and I will share it with you next week. I'm still kind of struggling to put it together. I'm going to share that with you next week, and if you have any suggestions, I am all ears. Let, let me know if, if this is something... If, if, if you have figured out a way to read the Bible consistently or regularly or read the Psalms regularly, let me know how you do it. I'm... I'd love to, I might do what you do. But uh, next week what we're going to do is we're going to dig into the various types of psalms. And I'm going to give you this tool that maybe that could help you read them. Because it's my hope that I can do what that mentor years and years and years and years ago told that, that young lady. That, that she would go out and teach people, make sure they knew how to pray. That, that is my hope. That in, in doing this this week and next week, I might be able to help equip you to grow in your ability to pray and to be what that first psalm describes, a sturdy tree planted in Eden, growing fruit each and every season. Amen.